To start us off, I want to introduce you to Aaron Pilardi, who's going to introduce our guest, uh, Jamu Green. Um, I've known Aaron since she was in her early 20s, about the same age as some of you, uh, when she was the uh, staff at uh, the, you were an intern, okay, so Aaron was an intern at the White House Project, but she was an intern supervising my daughter, who was a high school student, who was also an intern at the White House Project. Uh, and we have stayed friends for the 15 years since then. Uh, and she now runs uh, Vote Run Lead, which is an extraordinary program that trains women to run for political office. And I have to say, I think Erin is one of the most dynamic uh, women working in the space of getting more women elected, particularly at the state and local uh, level and is creating a pipeline of just amazing women from all over the country who are participating in the political process. So, Erin, it's all yours. And thank you so much, Key. Um, so yes, I'm actually 36, going on 37. Oh. That's my New Jersey voice. <laughs> Able to amplify. Um, that's my superpower. Um, I want to thank Kitty, I want to thank the Athena Center, the team there, Victoria, um, and really put a plug in for the Athena Film Festival. Bring your mom, it'll be a great weekend, and she'll say, remember when we went to the Athena Film Festival for the rest of your life. Um, it is a really remarkable experience. Um, and I actually got to have some uh, consultation here um, and help with uh, some of the programming at the Athena Center about five years ago, and it's, um, I'm always glad to come back. Barnard is an amazing place. Um, and so tonight we have a power talk for you with my friend, so this is really fun for me, Jamu Green. Uh, Jamu Green's a founding board member of Vote Run Lead, of which I am forever grateful. Um, and she would probably tell me right now to pause and say what Vote Run Lead is, because that's her expertise. I can feel it. So uh, Vote Run Lead is a training powerhouse for women to run for state and local office. We're really good at it. Um, our work is independent of political parties. We're really putting women first and giving them the skills and tools they need to run as they are. Um, we believe you have the networks, the talents, the experience to run for office just as you are. And we're gonna help you market those skills so you can be in politics, so you can figure out how to campaign and you can win and go on to govern successfully. Um, and we have, uh, just since the election, we had 3,000 women trained in about 10 months. 506 of them were in person with the last 13 or so uh, last week at Barnard College for one of the labs. It was with students, so that's, that's really remarkable. Um, and so women are running for local offices all across the country. Make sure you get out and vote. Make sure you're donating to these women. Um, and Jamu works with me at Vote Run Lead in that capacity. She tells me what to do from a communications perspective because that's her expertise. You may have seen her on Fox News. She's a progressive voice on Fox News several times a week. Um, follow her on Twitter and Facebook to catch it. There, she shares her expertise in democracy, um, in women's leadership, and uh, around social entrepreneurship. Um, she's pretty famous and made her mark officially as moving Rock the Vote to a couple million members when Rock the Vote really needed that boost about, what was that, 10 years ago? Um, has gone on to, uh, to co-found Define American, um, with, Anto with um, Jose, uh, and a range of really awesome folks around uh, progressive immigration policy. And um, there's even more to her um, that I know she'll share as she talks a little bit about her journey about how she got here. Now she's an Athena Distinguished Fellow, um, and I'm pretty excited for her to be with us tonight. So my first question for you, Jamu, um, is to share a little bit about your journey. Uh, you've been around the block a few times in a good way. I'm an around the way girl. <laughs> Is that a song? I, I guess I have. I, I was thinking about my story a, a little bit and, and realized that it's, it's pretty selfish as an organizer. I think everything that I've been engaged in uh, from an advocacy standpoint and you know, certainly even uh, my opinions on Fox News are driven by my personal pain. And you know, I can chart that back to when I had several friends in high school die in drunk driving accidents. I chose to start Students Against Drunk Driving on my campus and go on to work with Mothers Against Drunk Driving um, on their national board. And when I was 18 and went to vote for the very first time for Ann Richards, who was an amazing uh, 
and unique uh, voice for the issues I believed in and, and, and certainly a role model uh, as a young woman interested in politics growing up in Texas. And I had registered to vote on UT's campus. I walked into that polling place very excited and was told that my name was not on the list by a, a lovely poll worker who um, was very insistent that there was nothing that could be done and uh, I was not going to be able to cast my first ballot that day. So fast forward to my time at Rock the Vote, wanting to make sure that other young people didn't have to go through that same experience I did, which ended up with me in tears in that polling place uh, and, and begging and pleading to be able to vote for Ann Richards. When my very good friend, Jose Vargas, over dinner said that he was an undocumented immigrant uh, and had uh, come to find this out when he went to get his driver's license and was told these papers are fake, don't come back here. Um, we immediately started a conversation about the opportunity, the obligation, the responsibility as someone having such an incredible platform already as a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist that he had to contribute to the immigration reform debate that was going on at the time. And I, I think every activist, um, every uh, call to arms, in a sense, should start with personal pain. Uh, this work at times is, is very uh, all-consuming. Uh, it certainly requires passion and, and, and having that personal connection, really being able to relate to the communities uh, and, and their pain and, and, and how that situation could have been made better when you were facing that. Um, so that's always been my, my driving force. I, I think I see myself, though, um, always as a young grassroots organizer who wanted to help young people get involved in politics, wanted to make sure that women had uh, a place at the table uh, now at Fox News, uh, it's a little different platform, but I think in many ways at Fox News, I do the same thing. I, 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 could, I could go to um, other networks, um, other uh, outlets uh, that you know, speak to people who agree with me more than the Fox News audience. Uh, that, uh, in many ways for me personally, would be more of a vanity project. I look at every segment Every conversation I have on Fox News is an opportunity to connect with the audience, the movable middle. Um, I know that I'm not going to change the mind of Sean Hannity, you know, um, for example, but I know that there's someone out there watching that could benefit from some common sense perspective on the politics of the day. And, and certainly in this political environment, I think that is more needed than ever before. Absolutely. So you, you said the word platform a few times. You're a media specialist. You, you have a platform. You're using your voice. Um, tell us a little bit about the process to get there. We have a lot of young women in the audience who, you know, a decade down the line want to have a platform, want to have a platform now. So how do we, um, how did you build that and what advice do you have for young women? Well, the great thing is for, I think, everyone in this room and everyone who is watching on Facebook, um, the, the path to having a platform today is certainly much easier than when I started out. Uh, I think the first time I did television um, was 1998, working at the Democratic National Committee, running the women's office, and uh, was asked if I wanted to go and represent the DNC on this channel that I guess no one watched. And I, I raised my hand, no one else in the office raised their hand. I went on, I had no idea what I was doing. I had on probably like a plaid suit. <laughs> and I think I just repeated the same thing over and over. Um, you know, George Bush doesn't care about healthcare, education, the environment, or the economy. And I just kept saying the same thing because that was, um, you know, my fear was I didn't want to make a mistake uh, for the DNC brand. But today, it, it doesn't take someone you know coming into your office or uh, whatever environment you're in and, and asking do you want to be on television do you want to uh, give your opinion I mean we clearly see uh, the uh, opportunity for 
uh, many opinions, many strong opinions on on Twitter and, and how powerful that platform has been. Uh, and, you know, I take from my friend Jose Vargas who, who talks about the me in media. And that's, that's the age we're living in where media has been so democratized that whether it's Twitter or Facebook or podcasts or blogs or uh, all of the other platforms that I hear that you know teenagers don't even really look at <laughs> um, Twitter and Facebook, it's, it's Snap and, and, and all of these uh, newer platforms that I might not even be aware of from a brand standpoint, at your fingertips is the opportunity to amplify your platform. Um, with a push of a button, uh, it is very easy to take a stand on a political issue to uh, really show your expertise or show your concern about a, a multitude of issues. And I think that's what's so great about the work that Aaron does uh, at Vote Run Lead in really showing women uh, in uh, all of uh, their glory where they are today, that in this moment, we all have what we need to run as we are. Um, we have the expertise, we have the opinions, we you know, have uh, the networks, and we don't need any more experience. I, I look at it as someone is in the White House, the most powerful position on this planet, who had no experience at all. So every single one of you out there, uh, please make a decision to, to run as you are. Our secret mission. Um, Twitter has a little bit, has a, social media having that perspective, um, has its upsides and its downsides. Um, and I'd love for you to share a little bit about how you handle some of the trolling. I know that more women are pushing back, which is interesting, and what you've seen as a success story around um, amplification. Um. You know, I have uh, at times uh, been off of Twitter for months, and, and, and as someone who is in the media, just made a decision that I was going to reject the the hate and the attacks, and you can imagine I'm a progressive African-American woman uh, on a station that has a very large conservative audience, the type of feedback that I get when I go on air um, can be very jarring. The actual, the first time I ever got like a death threat was on Thanksgiving, and I was devastated. I was like, why on this day would someone choose to write something so hateful? And my brother-in-law had to focus me that you know, this person probably didn't have a place to go on Thanksgiving and wasn't, you know, surrounded by family and friends. And so it's been a process. I, I started off, like, you know, crawling up into a ball um, from being attacked on Twitter to uh, fighting back uh, and, and actually engaging um, with uh, uh, folks who disagree with me. Actually, um, uh, Jose also uh, has this formula that he talks about at times where if you have 13 engagements with someone who disagrees with you on Twitter or on Facebook or any of these platforms, that that after 13 is when they actually start listening. Um, so sometimes I go, <laughs> I go the, the, the distance and other times I shut it down and just block. Um, you know, certainly uh, it is a, it's a powerful platform in the environment we are experiencing right now where women, um, all across the world have uh, decided to share their stories, have decided to share their personal pain, um, have come together in community and said enough is enough, have said we are boycotting this uh, platform for a day, have then shifted to we are going to use these platforms to, to share these stories. And uh, when you think of the Me Too um, hashtag movement that started, 10 years ago um, with a, a young African-American woman who had uh, had an experience with a young girl who tried to share her story and, and she didn't have the right communication tools or um, in that moment to really, I think, support that young woman. Um, she started the Me Too hashtag. And fast forward 10 years later when Alyssa Milano uh, puts it out to her network, which is pretty large on Twitter, and you have um, 1.2 million uh, tweets uh, sharing the Me Too hashtag. Uh, something like 45% of uh, Facebook users in the U.S. Uh, have a friend 
who shared the Me, Me Too hashtag. I think there were 12 mi million Facebook posts. Um, so again, back to that earlier question, th this is the opportunity that everyone here has uh, and everyone uh, listening on Facebook that you can, using these tools, uh, really start movements um, and, and, and connect with communities uh, that will, will, will amplify uh, those messages. And I think the moment we are living in right now is the best of what these platforms have to offer. We've seen the worst. It happened for me personally a, a year ago, a year and a week. <laughs> Uh, almost um, on election day 2016 and and now we're seeing the best and um, I have been fortunate to uh, get the opportunity to to work closely with Rose McGowan as um, she is building up um, what we call Rose Army and uh, look forward to some big announcements coming out actually at the end of this week uh, about uh, how she's going to take her advocacy to the next level. And, and I think certainly within the women's community, there, there's opportunity for um, however these campaigns are being developed, um, whoever is you know, connected to them from a brand standpoint, that uh, there is a perfect storm. Um, and I, I think back to 1991, Anita Hill, when as a young woman, you know, just entering my <laughs> professional career, the world stopped for me, uh, hearing the experience that she had had, uh, being so frustrated at Democrats. And I was, you know, a committed Democrat at the time. And, and, like, why would they weren't asking the right questions? Why they weren't bringing on other witnesses um, who had similar experiences uh, with Justice uh, Thomas at the time? And I, I think we all saw, uh, you know, the issue of sexual harassment uh, be brought to the forefront, and and laws changed, were adjusted, perspectives changed, certainly, and then it went away. That's um, actually, that's my next question is, how do we make, we, the Me Too stuff is so powerful. We are, I totally agree. We are speaking with a powerful collective voice right now. And it, it's, it's kind of unfamiliar in some ways, mm -hmm. but also, you know, 20 years ago, we had a different kind of momentum. Was it 30 years, 20 years? Ooh. Um, 25. Yeah, 25, 25 years ago. Um, but how do we... You and I were talking, you know, in preparation for this about, like, we've got to go the extra mile. How do we make this permanent, real change? I, I think, and this is, you know, my reaction to not just this moment we're in, but I'd say probably the, you know, reaction to the 2016 election and some of the assessment that's been done uh, both by supporters of Hillary Clinton and by Hillary Clinton herself that I think we have to be braver. And... Um, I think in many ways that there was a sense of complacency that developed uh, around some of these issues. A progress was made, the Violence Against Women Act, um, you know, we you know, certainly have seen an increase uh, in our numbers, whether it's on college campuses and in so many different professions where women are out front um, in uh, who is in that pipeline to take over these professions. Uh, we've. We, we've come a long way, but at the same time, um, in stopping the telling of our stories, in um, perhaps not clapping back, um, you know, as uh, Hillary referenced about uh, that time on the stage when she could have clapped back to uh, President Trump when uh, he was invading her space and, and leering uh, over her intentionally as a way to try to intimidate her, uh, that, that we do need to be braver. Uh, and I, I think that that is going to have to be driven by a younger <laughs> um, demographic. And I, I think to some of the things we've heard uh, Hillary Clinton say about um, having self-censored and uh, really uh, the kind of uh, pushback from both the media and uh, from within even our own progressive communities, uh, over time, you self-censor. Um, you uh, aren't, uh, I don't want to say the passion isn't there, um, but the reflex, the fire, the fire isn't there. And um, I, I really think we, we, we have to embrace 
that perspective um, for not just a brief moment, uh, but until we have, say, from a political standpoint, until we have political parity, until we're at 50%, there's no room for uh, complacency. There just isn't. We're at 20%. I think we were on track to maybe come close to parity at in 2080, years. maybe, oh, was it 100? See, I was being optimistic. My DNC um, <laughs> campaign, I said, you know, we're on track to get to parity by 2080. Let's make it 2030. Um, you know, certainly we are seeing unprecedented numbers of women uh, sign up to, to run for office and, and, and put themselves out there. And we need that to not just be consistent, but actually probably right. double, triple, quadruple. So, and, and I mean, this is a power talk. We're here to talk about power. I think one of the places where we haven't seen this increase of power is in the political realm. We've been pretty stuck locally. We've got a lot of incremental wins. We, had, we saw a lot more women of color in the Senate. There were some um, fantastic local wins across the country for women. Um, but now we see tens of thousands of women raising their hand to potentially run for office. You ran for office. She put her hat in the ring for the chair of the Democratic National Party, and she ran for DNC chair this summer. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that experience and why you know that was potentially another platform for you and why you decided yourself to run. Certainly back to the, the personal pain point. Uh, I found myself uh, the first night of the convention that was going to nominate the first female uh, nominee for president from a major party that first night, I sat down in a box, and about a foot in front of me was the DNC member, state rep from the state of Georgia, who had sexually assaulted me in 1996 at the convention in Chicago for President Clinton. He was sitting right there. There was a thin piece of glass right between us, and it certainly took a lot not to leap over that glass and like put my hands around his neck. Just to be frank, to be blunt. But what it did for me, I, I, I was reminded of that situation. I was reminded that when I tried to tell my story, I was actually told by the deputy political director at the Democratic National Committee that if I said anything, I wouldn't be able to work in democratic politics. When I told my good friend, um, who happened to be working in the political department at the DNC, she also said the same thing. They made it clear that my career would, uh, in a sense, my, you know, the vision I had for my career would come to an end if I outed this guy who pushed me up against the wall in an elevator and it changed my life. Um, and that was within our party. That was within my party. Uh, I in that moment knew that there were a number of very serious issues that Democrats don't deal with, or even from a larger standpoint, the progressive community doesn't deal with when it comes to really um, protecting, or protecting is not the right word, when it comes to really you know, actually providing the right, type right. of foundation and support that right. they say women represent for the party. Democrats would be nothing without women, nothing. They would be certainly nowhere without black women. And that's just not reflected, I think, in a lot of ways. So that motivated me to run for the DNC, my personal pain, uh, Hillary Clinton's loss, uh, this historic moment, and you see a lineup of uh, men, uh, essentially, saying that they want to run this organization. And I was looking around to my right, to my left, and everywhere probably, <laughs> I think I probably had a conversation with Aaron about like, who's gonna step in? Who, uh, why is the stage not more women than it is men? At this point, after Hillary Clinton, it should be unremarkable to have a stage where more women are uh, seeking that one position. So I, I was disappointed by that and then also realized that the skills that are needed for that position, having worked at the DNC, having agitated on the outside uh, of the DNC, having built progressive uh, movements um, and worked in nonprofit, raised money, all of my experiences actually made me more qualified than the men who were up there, than the men who had, had put themselves out there. And, and I think that is parallel to the decisions that so many women uh, made after that election. And, you know, I, I, I thought the process um, would be easier as someone who has worked on so many campaigns, has trained women to run for office, 
And, uh, you know, it was eye-opening for me. I, I think the sense of complacency that I, I talked about a little bit, um, one of the biggest surprises from that race was the Women's National Democratic Club Forum. And I think we had about 15 different forums. Uh, after nominating a woman, this was the only one where we actually talked about women, which was interesting. Um, and the head of the Women's National Democratic Club Forum, uh, this was, you know, days after the Women's March, um, said that, you know, isn't it great that young women don't have to fight <laughs> because all the battles were won by their mothers and grandmothers. That is how she opened the forum. And I had walked in with a communications plan. I had, you know, my points and I knew exactly what I, how I wanted to present myself. And I, you know, for my opening remarks, had to throw all of that out the window because I had to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> what you just said <laughs> is wrong because you look at the Women's March and they were marching for criminal justice reform. They were marching for environmental justice. They were marching for women's health. They were marching on all of these issues in, in a very intersectional way. And, and, and these are rights that are still yet to be won. And, and, and language uh, around um, advocacy at times, I think, uh, can be actually contrary mm -hmm. to our goals. Um, it happens within the women's community. It happens, you know, certainly um, in some of these movements we've seen, these hashtag movements where women boycott Twitter happens and um, no, that's the wrong way to do it or right, right, the, right. the wrong thing was said and for me, as someone who has you know, spent some time looking at how the media can, can really move um, mountains uh, when it comes to uh, social justice uh, opportunities and how you tap into them, how you create virality in a sense, um, that all of these things are connected. And I, I think the perfect example is you have something like Women Boycott Twitter, which then allows for this movement of Me Too that had been moving along for 10 years without the attention that it absolutely needed and that the world needed uh, it to have, is then able to have the type of influence and take over our lives. Um, so I, I really try to see how those dots are connected from both what the opportunity is, um, how each of these campaigns build on each other versus how you, uh, spend time like trying to and we've, we've tear something about, down. Yeah, about sort of being a little more forgiving, right? That's yes. like, if you're gonna, you know, if you're in process of sort of learning about something, you are gonna stumble along the way. Sort of forgive yourself on that tweet you might not have loved, you know, or, and sort of forgive others for this immediacy that we're seeing, I think, on social media. I, I've been making mi mistakes, huge mistakes, my entire career. Like my first campaign, I was so proud of myself that I didn't go to Union Printer because it was more expensive. I just uh, cut and pasted the Union bug, which is a really important thing in Democratic politics, and I just pasted on some <laughs> on a piece of, on a flyer and made copies. And I went to the campaign manager and was like, "Look, see what I did? I saved us all this money. We didn't have to have a Union Printer do it." <laughs> and I mean, that in a sense, in many ways, is like the the idea that we're not going to fail, and this is. This for me is one of the most frustrating things that kind of assessing uh, women's leadership at times versus the opportunities that men have. And I, I'm happy to see so many men in uh, the audience uh, because this has to be a holistic um, uh, movement and holistic conversations. But in so many ways, men are allowed to fail up. And women uh, don't get those same opportunities um, professionally. And I don't think we give ourselves that opportunity uh, to fail up. We, when we fail, it's uh, really um, easy to get stuck in that failure versus the opportunity to see how that is actually going to amplify all of your efforts coming next. And, and, and that's been yeah. my experience. I mean, we, we see it around women in politics. It's one of the things I fear for sort of looking ahead in 2018, and, and I wanna shift there a minute, is that most women, the literature says, don't, don't run after they lose once. And that's beginning to change, but majorities of women who run and lose don't run again, which is actually like, it's a strategy to run and lose. I'm telling all these first time congressional candidates, like you're really running for 2020. 
right? So just getting that, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, you didn't win the DNC nomination. Mm -hmm. It's under uh, different le leadership. Um, and we, but we have this fascinating change where, um, you know, young people generally are not identifying with either of the two political parties. I think they're both under 30, so it's like 29 and 21 or something very low for uh, millennials identifying with either party. Uh, we have a new survey out with Marie Claire, young women. They were just as likely to want to run for office before the election as they were after, but are actually doing something about it now. So looking ahead at 2018, at 2020, what are some of your political predictions? Knowing that the winds are crazy, this <laughs> landscape is crazy, all caveats, I won't hold you to it, but um, for women, for this diversity of new people stepping forward for our democracy. Can, can I make one prediction that's maybe a little off message? Yeah, yeah. I think every woman who didn't uh, vote for Hillary Clinton has a special place in hell. <laughs> and that's where they're going. Um, and I say that actually to the previous conversation we were having about uh, being able to forgive yourself. And I, I, during the 2016 election, I was very frustrated when Madeleine Albright, Secretary uh, Albright, apologized for saying there's a special place in hell for a woman who doesn't help another woman. And, you know, to the point of like being braver and, and, and clapping back. And, you know, I look at Hillary Clinton and her original clap back of what did they expect me to do, stay home and bake cookies. Um, like, it's okay to be bold. It's okay to uh, make people uncomfortable. Um, yeah. It is okay. And, and we don't have to apologize for it because you know what? There are many people in very powerful places abusing that power who have never apologized for anything. Now, it's not about replicating evil. Like, certainly, that's that's not going to be the case. That's why I love Vote Run Lead as a nonpartisan organization because I know the Republicans and the Democrats who go through this program and end up in leadership that decisions are going to be made differently because women just do it better uh, when it comes to, I'd say, government and many other um, aspects of leadership. And um, so to the predictions outside of uh, <laughs> that special place in hell, I think in the 2020 presidential election on the Democratic side, there are going to be more women than men on the stage when we have those debates that, um, I don't know if I'm looking forward to them. Maybe if we could just pause <laughs> before we dive into another presidential election. Shrink the timeline for the debates, maybe so not it's, it's, 20 of them. It's a prediction, it's wishful thinking, it's kind yeah. of like a pushing, <laughs> come on. Senator Harris, That'll come on, Jill Brand. That'll be quite a visual. Come on, Warren. Mm -hmm. get, let's, it's not remarkable to have multiple men up on that stage. And right. It cannot be remarkable to have multiple women up on that stage. And, and hopefully I, the opportunities or the women who are looking at this as an opportunity, I hope they see that as well. Great, great. Um, and I want to thank you for being brave. I think some of what you shared was also some of the first times that you're sharing that. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to, oh, yeah. I want to open it up to questions, um, both on Facebook Live. Hey, uh, send it to us, I think, via Twitter. We're uh, mo mo monitoring. Um, if you want to send a question in for Jammu. Um, and here in the audience, we ask that you just wait for the mic um, and state your name. If you're a Barnard student, we'd love to know. All right. And there's two microphones there and there. Or statements. Right here, right here in the purple. Hi, I'm Nava. I'm a student at Barnard. And my question is, how do you manage to, con to um, promote your message and have civilized conversations and like work on Fox in an environment that you know like isn't promoting always the most honest message? And also, how do you know that, or does it affect you the fact that potentially that's where the president is getting his news and that you're on a network that maybe has um, an advantage over other networks and like how do you work with that um, maybe inner struggle of working for the bad guy but doing the right thing. <laughs> gotcha. Um, how do I as a, you know, 
unapologetic progressive um, work within the Fox News environment, and I've, I've been a, a political analyst at Fox for now uh, seven years. Um, so it's, it, I've had some time <laughs> uh, to adjust. I, you know, it really, for me, goes back to the question of what is my motivation for being in front of that camera? And from an organizing standpoint, I, you know, you have to identify who your audience is. My audience is never going to be the host, and Fox News has developed some of the best communicators uh, on the planet. I think that uh, people on the left need to really understand how they are so effective in their communication. I know there are battles to be had across different networks, um, but I think sometimes as uh, Democrats, we should stop and say, okay, how are they communicating in a way that um, is connecting more with the heart than the head as far as the order? Um, and and I, do, I do think that conservatives do that well. For me, it's the audience again. So it is very easy to debate someone who is talking nonsense to an important audience that I know has uh, power to change an election, which then has power to change laws and regulations and all of the things that we've seen crumble around us uh, in the current situation in the White House. Um, and I, I think at times we forget as organizers who our, who our primary audience is. Um, if your primary audience is to tear down your ally because they didn't say something the right way or they didn't do something in the right order, um, you know, that's on you. That's never been my, um, my approach to things. And so I can happily go on Fox News and happily debate insanity because the person watching the common sense that I uh, hopefully can communicate is, uh, is gonna make a difference. It's gonna make a difference in how they act. It's gonna make a difference in, um, not just from a political standpoint, but hopefully how they connect with other communities. Um, many of Fox News' audience are not a, you know, African-American woman. Um, and I think, and I'll, I'll tell this story, even though it's, it's a bit hard. But it just happened um, a couple of nights ago at the One America Appeal concert that the five living former presidents did in College Station, Texas. And I was very fortunate <laughs> to get to go and, and spend And I was the very jealous. Um, it was, uh, <laughs> you know, College Station, I grew up in Austin, Texas. There's a big rivalry between the University of Texas and Texas A&M and just the, the different communities. and. Um, I, I went into that situation certainly wanting to hear the music, certainly wanting to see the, the five former living presidents. I came away from it with two major revelations. Um, one is how much I miss my country, and I hadn't really processed that before. Like even you know, George Bush, like I had tears when George W. Bush was on that stage and talking, and when he won <laughs> against Ann Richards in Texas, <laughs> I hated him. <laughs> I remember that hate. I remember what it felt, felt like. But So I came away from that knowing I didn't know how much I missed my country. The second thing was I had a conversation with President Clinton, and unprompted, he said, what you do at Fox is so important because the audience needs to see the sparkle in your eyes, the smile on your face, the tone of your voice, and hear the brilliant words you're saying. Now, it's hard to say that, like, I, I'm not trying to, like, <laughs> brag, but it was um, in a moment where I, I do sometimes question, like, am I making a difference? Am I making a difference? And then he followed up by saying, and in that order, and that change that you are making for that audience is going to help Democrats for decades. That is why I go on Fox News. And to hear that reflected back to me by President Clinton, it was the best night I, of my life, probably. Um, and I think that we, as you know, social justice activists, um, people who want to change the world, make it a better place, get to political parity, we need to understand that change doesn't happen by chance. And change, at times, is, is going to need confrontation. Um, that confrontation is a catalyst. Um, 
talking only in safe spaces uh, is, is, is not going to further, um, I think, the efforts that are so righteous and, and so necessary. So I'll say tonight, it is very easy to embrace going and, and debating against um, very good conservative communicators, but I'm also human. I mean, it gets to me. The first time I ever shaved my head um, into this uh, mohawk was the Trayvon Martin um, uh, decision came down, and uh, I had a friend who's a producer call me and tell me that there was a situation happening and maybe I should wait till I got to the building because Robert Zimmerman, George Zimmerman's brother, was walking around high-fiving folks. And I shaved my head because I was so disgusted. But um, the, the value add of that um, connection with the audience and the opportunity as an organizer, that, that outweighs it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Way in the back, our friend. Hi, good evening. Uh, my mother went to Barnard um, and graduated in 42, 1942. Um, I wanted to ask you, is it possible that the write-in space could be used as a rehearsal space, uh, a rehearsal method for people who wanted to break into more formal politics in the next, the following election? and. Uh, 20 votes would be considered a big win? Yeah, I, and I think that's part of a larger question. His, his question was about write-in candidates. You do have a lot of people running right now that don't aren't checking the box for Dems, aren't really checking the box for ours, or have all of these other sort of labels before they go with party. And But we know the party infrastructure is pretty strong. You know, you can beat it. Um, but there's pros and cons to doing, you know, how... How much are you engaging in the party locally? How much you need to engage as, with the party as you rise? This idea of write-in candidates. What are some of the ways that you're seeing people sort of get a little more of that electoral influence? Look, I think there are 20 million people who um, still have health care because of a write-in candidate, uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski <laughs> in uh, um, Alaska when you know she did not win the Republican nomination. So uh, clearly... There's there's power in uh, subverting uh, the normal pathway, and I, I think that there's complacency there too. Um, you know, there's a lot of movement from supporters of Senator Bernie Sanders to go into Democratic um, parties at the local level and and get involved in uh, leadership at the local level in those parties. Um, you know, in in attempts to even take over um, state parties where there's been success and and I think people need to do more of that. I mean certainly that was a, a part of what compelled me to run for DNC chair was wanting to purge <laughs> and, and wanting to make some very serious changes and uh, there's not an understanding of how much power um, is in I think local political power parties. I think the media and um, all of the attention being so focused on you know presidential elections and and just this now echo chamber of responding to um, what this person uh, puts out on Twitter as being the news of the day that uh, our, our media reinforces that disconnection um, from that power at the local level uh, I think uh, it's up to us though to celebrate victories more um, you know those unexpected victories when it comes to organizing efforts or, uh, you know, there are different ways of voting. Fair Vote uh, is a good organization that does a lot of work around this. Um, yeah. and, and we don't, we don't celebrate victories. We don't do a really, we don't do a better job of communicating success or what success would, would look like. Um, a lot of times as progressives, what is frustrating is we, we want to talk about the bullet points and the percentages and, and the facts, and we forget to talk about the heart, and we forget to connect with the heart. And I see my colleagues um, at Fox News uh, do that very effectively. We, we need to find a way of looking at shared values as how we lead from a communication standpoint, and I think that's happening um, within the Me Too movement and the, the storytelling. Uh, why storytelling is so important for women who are running for office so they can share challenges they've overcome. Um, so I'm all for 
uh, revolution in um, how candidates are nominated, in how uh, uh, political parties approach, uh, uh, you know, organizing at the local level, and I, I think we need to keep that as a part of our toolbox. Um, and some people have forgotten it's a, it's a, it's an important part of the toolbox. Yeah, great. And um, I, there was a young woman in the front for a question. Yeah, right here. Great, thank you. Is it? Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm Sophia. I go to Columbia College. Um, but I love Barnard, um, and <laughs> I just wanted to know um, kind of what you guys do uh, in your organization and what you suggest we at um, universities like this do to ensure that um, it's not only white women who are encouraged to go out and run for office, that it's also women of color, women of um, other marginalized groups, um, kind of how you go about advocating for those women. Aaron does a really good job. Uh, the diversity at Vote Run Lead is, um, it, it is, it should be applauded and understood and, and recognized more. Uh, there's, there's a lot of organizing happening, I think, within the space and some really great work and, and allied organizations, but uh, I've never seen um, in, you know, all of my years of organizing um, as much success in diversity that is, um, I don't know if this is the right way to say it. It's not necessarily forced diversity. There are, there are uh, efforts for diversity within the progressive community that when it's being organized and, and the reasons behind it, um, it feels really forced. And that then also translates to how you communicate and is it authentic and how you connect with the community that you're trying to bring in. And so I, I do applaud Aaron. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how you do it, I know for me, um, even in running for the DNC chair, I knew that black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party and candidates just cannot win without the votes of black women and watching that stage not have a black woman up there, um, I also knew would have, uh, send a very clear message um, to all of those black women who, who have been voting and supporting uh, the party. And, and so seeing um, yourself represented uh, in leadership is, is also really important. But I'd love, Aaron for you to also tackle that question. Um, so I had the opportunity to found Vote Run Lead in 2014. And, um, but that's sort of the, the short version. We ran Vote Run Lead as a national field program, an organization called the White House Project for about eight years, of which Kitty was on the board. And we got in our cars and we traveled all over the country and trained about 15,000 women in eight years. Um, we will probably hit that number in about three and a half years using tech in this sort of, as, as Vote Run Lead is now a standalone organization really focused on training women. Um, but our first conference was actually in um, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis. And we're going back there this year, which is pretty powerful. And uh, Marie Wilson and I, the founder of the White House Project, she also created President Barbie. She also created uh, Take Your Daughter to Work Day. So a pretty remarkable woman that had seen a lot in her day. And we walked into this room that was organized by one of my co-founders, Liz Johnson. And um, she cursed and said, what is this, the F and UN? And it was, I, I said, I'm like, you can't say that, right? You can say that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was pretty young at the job. Liz had been also trained um, by a community organizer. Liz herself was a community organizer. and. Um, the organization put resources, financial resources, behind um, the outreach that was done. It wasn't a commitment to it. Um, and I think we're, when we're here, we're talking about diversity, we're talking about uh, race and ethnicity, but it was more than that. It was making sure that low-income women were included, uh, that rural communities were included, um, that folks who maybe wanted to share or didn't want to share if they identified in the LGBTQ community. Um, and really, really um, brilliantly, Marie had connected um, all of the women's funds and foundations across the country. New York Women's Foundation is one of the remarkable ones. They're here in New York City. Um, Minnesota has a remarkable women's foundation. And the grantee networks. So your nonprofit applies for a grant. These foundations were only giving grants to women-led nonprofits, and they've been doing it for 30, 40 years. And that's the community that we tapped into. It was women who should have already been running our government. And 
you also celebrated and amplified the voice of Shirley Chisholm as yeah, a part we of took a this way. great film, which is why I love the Athena Film Festival. We took the Shirley Chisholm uh, documentary around the country with us, and people had no idea of the history of 1972. Um, it's a fu it's a fantastic documentary. You've had it at the festival. Um, I think you can get it on Amazon for like 4.99 or something. Um, it's one of those. The clothes are amazing. Like it's an um, it's you gotta you gotta check it out. And it was one of those tools where um, you were able to show a role model. You were able to show a really brave woman. And Shirley Chisholm understood power. She knew she wasn't going to win. She was going for delegates. So that when the platform was made, that she was able to have X number of delegates, and she had that much political capital. And that's what we need to do. And that's what we're doing at Vote Run Lead is telling women one, you have political capital more than just voting. Um, and we're not spending it. We're not spending it as elected officials. We're not spending it as donors to candidates. Um, we're not spending it in speaking our truth in, in the social media and the op-ed pages. Um, and so we're really just teaching women how to gain and spend political capital. And it's a slow strategy to take over the world. Um, and what's really great about, what are we now, 12 years later? Um, Speed it up. We are. It can't, it can't be slow anymore. We have yeah, step on the This accelerator. is like the accelerator part, the next three years. This is where we take those 10,000 women who said, okay, vote run lead, I want to run, show me how, and we get them to run right now. And that includes you. It includes the first 25-year-old and the youngest woman ever to run, all of that. We need first and onlys all over the country. The acceleration. Yeah. I think that's uh, where I am at uh, as an organizer and, and just yeah. you know what I'm, I, the line I'm drawing in the sand as far as what I'm going to spend my time doing, what I'm not going to be paying any attention to if if uh, an effort is getting us closer <laughs> to parity if if we are kicking down doors and putting our neck our feet on necks that need to <laughs> be stomped down mm -hmm. and I don't mean to create a violent <laughs> image because I'm not a violent person but there's some real violence that has happened to us as women in the workplace and and, and certainly uh, from a sexual assault standpoint, but if we meet it um, in a way that uh, uh, is complacent or excuses it, then that's what's led to this person, a narcissist with white supremacy tendencies being the most powerful person in the universe, our known universe. <laughs> um, because I look at even, and you know, not to, not to attack, but to assess when we had the US senators um, in the past few days who came out and talked about their Me Too stories. And I was reading um, Claire McCaskill's, um, Senator McCaskill, and uh, she talked about her experience, I think it was with the uh, head of the Missouri House of Representatives, um, and she told her story and, and then followed up her story by saying, well, I knew he was joking, but you know what? He wasn't joking. And the excusing of it as a joke is exactly the excusing of locker room talk that helped the majority of white women vote for President Trump. I'm not into excusing this anymore. And, you know, efforts, uh, opportunities that look at excusing it. Um, that's kind of the, you know, be brave. We have to do more. When we get to the point where there's parity, then maybe we, we, we coast. <laughs> and then we can get to 75% and that's when <laughs> it's on. But um, until we get there, we, we have to do more. And I know we've been doing more. I know that we've, we've the whole Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire example that Governor Richards uh, talked about, um, you know, Ginger did everything um, that he did, but in back, like in heels and backwards. That's what we're gonna have to do. Uh, and, and in this moment, when we have all of these tools, when we have the attention of the world, this is, this is happening globally. Um, I, I love the way the French approach the Me Too movement. Um, I can't say the French word, but it was, it meant call out your pig. Yeah. That was the hashtag? <laughs> that was, it's, it's the French <laughs> way of saying call out your pig. <laughs> and, you know, all props to me too, but right now I, I'm for calling out the pigs and, and holding them accountable. 
uh, and accountability has not been a, a, a part of, I, I think, a lot of these movements. Um, and that fear that comes with accountability, fear is a motivating factor. Um, we've seen it in, in our political process. It certainly helped uh, President Trump get elected. And on this issue, I, I'm okay with uh, fear being uh, a big part of the way that advocacy is uh, succeeding. This is the 100th time in my life that I've said, I wish I spoke French. Ugh. <laughs> uh, take the language courses at Barnard. So we, we have time for one more question. Okay, here in the front. And if there's any questions online, let us know. Hi, Hi. Um, I'm Vitsul Abdul Hafiz. I'm actually not a student at Barnard. I go to a Fordham University, but I, um, Barnard College is phenomenal. I have nothing but respect for the students here. Um, my question for you is, um, as we know, like misogyny is, is like a bar, bipartisan issue. You know, like how do you, as a woman of color, specifically a black woman, how do you? Um, address misogyny that exists within um, democratic spaces? You know, how do you deal with, how do you personally deal with um, your fellow Democrats bel belittling your intellect, you know? How, how do you personally overcome that? Call it out, hold them accountable, you know, reflect the um, nastiness <laughs> that they are putting out, reflect it right back to them, um, question them. And, you know, certainly, as I said earlier, don't excuse it. Don't forgive it. Um, I, I really am someone who looks at coalition building, and um, I'm big into forgiveness. Um, I, I think all of these things have a place, a time and a place. Uh, but in the moment, uh, certainly in my career, when I've been uh, faced with uh, people who I agree with on and, and I thought shared my values and, and certainly shared the vision of the, the world and uh, the country and our politics. Uh, when they say something that is off-putting, um, I'm more likely to call them on it. And I think anyone who knows me knows that I, I don't have a, a fear of burning a bridge um, in, in many ways. And I, I think in life, to be successful, we do have to burn some bridges um, so that we can build some new ones and bigger ones um, and stronger ones. Uh, so the lesson I learned back in 1996 at the convention in Chicago where I had uh, you know, a very high up Democratic official and a good friend uh, tell me to you know, basically stand down, um, that was maybe the one time that I've stood down. And since then, not necessarily saying that it's easy, but that's where the we have to be braver comes from. Um, not necessarily saying that it's going to make you the most amount of friends, but you know, I think professionally for me, I've been able to be successful because it's, it's not about the number of friends I have, but it's about the um, passion and the uh, connection that my friends and colleagues, and, and whether it's from an organization like Vote Run Lead or uh, different uh, advocacy efforts, uh, Define American with Jose Vargas, that we, we work together in a way that is unapologetic. And um, that creates success. And so be more unapologetic, um, which I think was a part of uh, is the title of the Shirley Chisholm documentary uh, that was the start of Vote Run Lead. Great. All right. We have one last question in the back. Yes. Um, so hi, I'm Victoria. I work here at Barnard at the Athena Center. Um, I have a question about free speech. Um, you're a communications specialist, a media strategist. Um, free speech is a value, um, an American value that we hold deeply, and yet there's been a lot of talk in the media recently about the alt-right and how free speech has been weaponized. Um, and I guess I'm just curious about how you balance the contradiction between um, being able to speak your mind um, and uh, combating individuals who are using this value to just spread blatant untruths and fake news. And when you have someone in the White House saying things like all Mexicans are drug dealers and rapists, and he reserves the right to say that um, because of free speech, how do you fight back against that? 
So a lot of folks don't know that Rock the Vote was actually founded um, to protect free speech. Uh, it, it was not a young voter organization, but it was when um, the band Two Live Crew, this rap group, uh, was arrested in Florida and their lyrics were, were, were pretty out there. Um, and certainly the things they said about women and, and there was a record industry executive who saw that arrest and, and realized that you know, free speech from a certainly artist musician standpoint was coming under attack and founded Rock the Vote and it made sense that the uh, most uh, motivated people to really uh, support those efforts were gonna be young people and it was a campaign against Tipper Gore, um, actually, uh, that was a big part of founding Rock the Vote. So free speech for me is, has been a, a, a core part of my organizing. I, I, I don't want to be influenced by the Fox News um, perspective around um, the, uh, you know, the conflict between alt-right and uh, Antifa and um, kind of that narrative that's out there, but I do believe that on the left, there has been, we have taken a step back to where we don't want to hear anything that we disagree with. And that goes to... But what about know. sort of truth versus disagreement? I think that's becoming this, where it's like, this isn't true. Like, here's 17 studies, here's five links, here's like, this is actually not true. This I highly disagree with. And that feels like it's kind of getting conflated a little, a lot. It, it's certainly getting conflated. I, I do think, though, that um, even if someone who disagrees with us is not telling the truth, and our um, first attempt is to basically take away their ability to speak, um, like that undermines American values. And um, so there's kind of this inside baseball uh, effect um, that we forget that who's the main audience watching this and, and how, how do they take away a message. Um, we have millions of media messages coming at us. And that audience, what they hear is they disagree and you don't want this person to speak because they disagree. If that's their takeaway, then as progressives, we're losing. To your point about the truth, uh, I certainly think there has to be accountability, uh, whether it's a platform like Twitter, platforms like Facebook. I know that there's some new um, uh, pieces that came out what Twitter is going to do when they do political ads. They're going to show who paid for the ad. They're going to show how much money they're spending. Um, so there's accountability that's been a part of our other kind of political communication vehicles, you know, commercials. I'm Hillary Clinton and I approved this message, right. but hasn't applied to these um, new uh, media um, opportunities. I, I also think that um, the accountability with the media uh, is something that needs a lot of attention. And I'm very disappointed that in the assessment of the 2016 election, and, and you look at um, like very just straight <laughs> down the line research that shows the media covered Hillary Clinton's scandals more than they covered her issues, and they covered Donald Trump's issues more than they covered his scandals. And it's just the numbers reflect Which that. Lines up completely <laughs> with how women have, how journalists have been treating women candidates for two decades. And and there hasn't been accountability. There hasn't been a, a kind of rec personal reckoning. I think that um, needs to happen. But also, the the idea of these false equivalencies that you you raise up something that is is not true because you have to have a message that is counter to the you know political party. Um, and, and that's just nonsensical, um, and it's dangerous. And, and I don't understand why they don't see that that's dangerous. Uh, there are so many um, different ways we can look at the, the election of 2016 and, and point fingers, and um, I watch a lot of Netflix and drink a lot of whiskey um, to, to process, but I do think that the false equivalency uh, that was drawn um, when you have, uh, whether it's a scandal or even a candidate trying to get their issue out, and because you need to find this balance, um, we had credible sources lifting up messages that were just blatantly false, and so there needs to be accountability on that front.
okay. as well. That's a whole other power talk, I yes. think. Yes, <laughs> which we'll all come back for. Um, I want to say thank you to Jamu. Uh, I want to say thank you to the Athena Center here at Barnard for having us and for having the talk and for having the Athena Center, which is a powerful, awesome thing inside of Barnard College. Um, and I encourage you all to check out voterunlead.org. Um, we are training women to run for office in a couple of weeks in a big, intensive three-day, actually in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Ilhan Omar will be our keynote speaker. She's the first Somali-American Muslim woman to serve at the highest, this is the highest level of, of uh, any one of her stature. She's also pretty cool. Um, and a mom of three, and someone who's been through our program. Um, and I know last week we sparked a couple Barnard students to come, so maybe we can uh, we can get a little delegation um, out from Barnard, which would be great, and Columbia too. Um, tons of online resources for you how to learn how to run for office, whether that's just how do I get on a campaign, how do I get started. Um, they're going to share around last week's Power Talk, specific, uh, excuse me, uh, Leadership Lab, on how to actually run, specifically for college students. We talked a lot about strategy versus tactics, which I think was not said explicitly, but a, sort of underlying to what your whole life's work has been. Um, and we're excited for you to potentially run for office in the next three years. All right. Be brave. Be brave. Thank you, Jamu.